uh, who is a speaker for this morning. Um, she is an emer emeritus professor from the University of Connecticut and a professor of sociology. She wrote extensively on media, gender, and high, higher education. She is a firm believer in Simmel's dictum that most, almost anything can be transformed into an interesting sociological problem. Although she thinks of herself as an ethnographer, she has also published work on historical methods. And today, Gay will be talking about a very old historical phenomena of um, Jewish tradition having um, Chinese food on Christmas. So, so please, Gail. Um, Thank you. Okay. I'm going to be sniffling at you because this is the beginning of hay fever season. Um, and um, I, I also should tell you very quickly that <clears throat> I'm not going to just speak about um, Jew Jews and Christmas. This is going to be a little more complicated. And it's going to be a little more complicated because I'm 80 years old. Um, and to me, that means that I heard my grandparents speak about growing up. My grandparents grew up in Romania. Half of my family grew up in a city that's now in Romania. It was then in Moldova. And um, the other half of my family grew up in a city of Romania that's now Hungary. So um, I heard stories that they were usually fairly careful not to tell in front of me. God forbid I should know there's discrimination in the world. But I still heard some of them. I've been teaching, this is going to hurt, because you're such kids, since 1969. And because I'm that much older than you, I've also seen much more discrimination than you have. So it's hard for me to talk about Jews and Chinese food and New York City when I suspect that a lot of you don't know what I know. I'll give you just a tiny example. One of the first courses I ever taught in 1969, I was, I was then, I think, all of 26, um, was a course on race. And I said to my class, meaning it, that race is not a black problem, it's a white problem. The problem is the white people. And they got so insulted. I was never permitted to teach that course again. This was not something that one could say in 1969, OK? Um, how many of you are the children of immigrants? OK, not many. How many of your grandparents were immigrants? We're getting a little better. So were your, are your grandparents from Europe, or are they from elsewhere in America? America includes South America, too, you know? They, they call themselves Americans. Where, 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 are your, where are your people from? Are you all historically Americans? I mean, if you're going to say that, that means that some of you have membership in Indian tribes. So I doubt that's true, though there were some very good big tribes around here. OK? So let me start by saying to you that there is no such thing as a Jew. That is, 
S someone called me the other day uh, from some magazine, and they wanted to know what a Jew was. And I had this extraordinary problem because I had to know which of the many sects, we'll use it that term, within Judaism they belong to. And I also had to know what country their families had come from. Some of this is miraculous. I had this terrific dentist who retired recently. He was two years older than me, and he said that he was really getting tired, you know? And he, he was from um, Iraq. And I said, when did you come here? He said, my parents started moving us here in 1947. Uh, from one of those Arab countries. So I said, why? And he said, well, you remember when the Babylonians destroyed King Solomon's temple. And I had to admit, I learned about it in Hebrew school. I think that was over 2,000 years ago. I know it was over 2,000 years ago, probably 2,300 years ago. And he said, well, my family was, was one of the families that was taken from Jerusalem and put in this country. And then when everybody got back to go back to Palestine, Israel, Judea, whatever you want to call the country that used to be there or is there now, they didn't go back, they stayed. And then around 1947, they realized it was about to get very dangerous. And so they kept the two oldest sons, there were nine children, here to help with the family business. And as each of us got college age, we got sent to the United States. This was my periodontist. W one of his older brothers did heart transplants at Harvard. They were adequately bright. And their parents were extraordinarily wise because they got seven of their nine kids out of there. That is a very different kind of Jew than me. My family started coming here around 1900, but like many people my age, I could tell you about cousins who were killed in the Holocaust. I am actually related on my maternal grandmother's side to Elie Wiesel, which is a big deal. But unfortunately, my aunt, who knew how I was related, forgot to write it down before she died. So all I know is that somewhere on my grandmother's side, my paternal grandmother's side, there's this relationship. I am very different from German Jews. I am very different from French Jews. I am very different from Jews who grew up in Arab communities. Jews and Arabs got along terrifically well for thousands of years until the Europeans started colonization in many of those countries. At which point, 
they introduced a lot of what is a lot of continuing hatred between these groups. Okay? I am not the kind of Jew my grandfather was. My grandfather, both sides, would have died before they ate trace. Trace is a Yiddish word that means not kosher. And kosher means a set of rules that are written in the Old Testament that rabbis have been reinterpreting now for 2,000 years. There was even some reinterpretation in Israel two years ago. On Passover, the holiday that ce celebrates when the Jews left Egypt, you know, Moses let them out and all that kind of stuff you hear in the Bible. Jews from the Sephardic countries, the Arab countries, ate rice. Jews from the European countries did not eat rice. And here they all are in Israel, also busy fighting with the Arabs, right? However, it made for a problem. There's an Ashkenazi head rabbi, there's a Sephardi redhead, redhead rabbi, and they all gave different interpretations to people who came from different countries, not to speak of the problems created by Ethiopians who had been Jewish in Ethiopia for well over 2,000 years. So originally the rule was, you eat what your grandparents ate, that does it. And then they ran into this big problem, because Jews from one country were marrying Jews from another country, and no one knew what to eat on Passover. So they made a rule that everybody could eat rice. That sounds a little funny, but it gives you an idea of how much variation we're talking about. And we're also talking about variation. When we talk about the Lower East Side, when I think it was my mother's family moved there, or began to move there, some there, some in Ellington, about 1905. Because in 1905, the Jewish section of the Lower East Side was divided by country. My family lived on a Romanian block. That's how my mother's mother got married. She was supposed to marry one of her first cousins, as was frequently done in Europe. And someone up the block said that in America, they said that that was bad luck. And this made a great problem, because I had an engaged grandmother. And one of the neighbors said, don't worry, my son will marry your daughter. Which they couldn't have done if they weren't on a Romanian block. Everybody follow? When I talk about Chinese, or Chinese food, we are also talking about extraordinary variation. I don't know how many languages are spoken in China. I know there's an official language, Mandarin. And I know that there are many Qi people 
in China who cannot speak this language. One of my books was recently translated into Chinese and I got to deal with the loveliest liberal Chinese professors. We understood one another. We exchanged jokes, sometimes not blatantly said, because after all, his mail got read and mine doesn't. And then about last month, I went on Zoom to listen to this Chinese guy give a lecture at Moscow State University. They give this lecture to anyone in communications who wants to listen. And I figured, what the hell, this is interesting, I'm going to listen to this guy. Boy, I thought he was Mao Zedong's grandson. I mean by that, I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning to hear a lecture that would be given 7 o'clock my time, 3 o'clock in Moscow, and late afternoon in China. It gets difficult because everyone in China has the same time. So it's really weird. So if you want to make arrangements to talk to someone in China, you have to get it translated. You have to say something like, what time of day will it be? Supper time or breakfast time in your part of China? So the guy said, to the Russian lady who is leading this. What's she doing here? And I have to tell you, my work on news, and this was a communication thing, is in nine or ten languages. So she just said, she comes every now and then. And I do. It's a really easy way to learn things without reading. And the man said, hello. And I said, at five of seven in the morning, really hurting, good morning. And he said, what do you mean it's afternoon? <laughs> and then gave a wonderful lecture about how all Chinese are the same. And I have to tell you, I was terribly well behaved. If he had been someone in my family, and I hope you will now excuse me for swearing, I would have said bull But he wasn't someone in my family. He wasn't even someone in my class, and I've said things like that to people in my class. He was pretending that all Chinese are the same. As much as we like to pretend that all people who live in the United States are the same kind of American. And it is so important to the survival of our country for all of us to understand that is one big lie. Okay? So with that, let me start talking about Chinese food. I should probably find what says this my first page. <laughs> Historically, there has been big trouble 
in the United States about who's who. In the 1840s, there was something called the Know Nothing Party. At least that's what it's called in our history books. I don't know if any of you learned about it in high school. I'm so old that I did. The Know Nothing Party, which also called itself the Native American Party or the American Party, was founded to keep the Irish out. Irish were starting to come here because there was this small, meaningful famine in their country. And the English didn't like the Irish. Some people even claim that England experimented on how to set up a colony by practicing on Ireland. So as far back as we can go, there are those differences. As far back as we can go, there were also differences between the Jews who lived here. The first Jews who lived here were Sephardim. That means that their families were told to convert to Catholicism or to die or to get out of Spain or Portugal some years later or else. Some of them went to a place called Amsterdam, which had a couple of really famous philosophers who you might even have heard of. And some of them went on Spanish ships and Portuguese ships and established colonies in Brazil, heavily Portuguese Jewish, Argentina, Chile, and New York City. The first Jews in the United States were Sephardim. The Ashkenazi from Eastern Europe did not begin to show up until about the 1880s. And they showed up for a variation of the reason that the Sephardim had gotten the hell out of Spain. They were getting killed. I don't know how many of you know the word Pogrom, P-O-G-R-A-M. I remember learning it when I was a kid. When I was told that a pogrom was the Jews and the Christians lived separately. They didn't share villages. They might be neighboring, but they didn't live together. A pogrom was when the Christians said, every Passover, the Jews are killing Christian children to eat them as matzah. It's a really kind of yucky kind of food. I'm always glad when Passover is open over. I don't like it. It's much too dry. And they would then go and maybe have a pogrom. That meant they would go to a Jewish village and they'd kill everyone with guns. So I also grew up knowing that word program, pogrom. About six or seven months ago, I was reading this book 
that really did me in. It discussed someone who lost her grandparents in a pogrom. And it described how her grandparents, who were then in their 70s, were told to take off their clothes and run down the main stream, the main street of the village, as the local Christians shot at them. This is a very good reason to leave a country. Okay? And all those people from all those different countries left because of stuff like this. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Holocaust, you'll find that the percentage of the Jewish population killed in any particular Holocaust country, this is disgusting statistics, is an indication of how bad the anti-Semitism was in that country. And just to give you a feeling for stupid stuff, one of the countries that had the least percentage of Jews get killed was Germany. They might have organized some pretty good killing. But they weren't the worst. Okay? So when the Jews came here to New York, and well over 50% of the Jews in the United States lived in New York City until, until the 1950s, they moved to the Lower East Side where they were neighbors with other groups coming to New York about the same time. This includes Italians and the Chinese. The first Chinese in New York came about 1780 or 1790. They were imported to grow rice down in the deep south. You all know Chinese eat a lot of rice. So the idea was, if they eat it, they must know how to grow it. But it didn't work out. Because soon afterwards, the cotton gin was invented in New Haven, which very much sympathized with the South through much of the Civil War. They did their main business with the South. And instead, the South started importing even more Africans. The Chinese really started coming to the United States about the time of the gold rush, which gives us the 1840s, and they were in the San Francisco area. I visited one of my cousins who lives near there recently, and he showed me a sign down the street from him that said, this is where the announcement of the discovery of gold was made in 1843. And we all looked at it, it was a whole lot of my cousins were there, and we said, well, okay. The Chinese were imported mainly from Canton 
And most Chinese who came to the United States until relatively recently were from Canton. There's a different way to say it in Chinese and I can't do it. Okay? And they, they, were, they were really important because the Chinese knew how to do something that none of the Europeans knew how to do. Play with dynamite. So all these white people, you know, they're going to these rivers and these brooks and they got the stuff with them and they're taking up water and hoping they find a piece of gold. And the Chinese got here, they'd borrow money that they had to pay back to someone else back home. Only the men were permitted to come. And they did this extraordinary thing. They used dynamite. And you know, if you use dynamite on rocks and stuff, you find the gold that would eventually come into the river. And it made the white people very, very unhappy. I mean, this gold was for the white people. It wasn't for the Chinese. The Chinese did not have an easy time on the West Coast. Some of them moved up to Oregon, a country which later in its history would forbid black citizenship, or rather a state that later in its history would forbid black citizenship. And there were the equivalent of pogroms where the Chinese were killed. And there was this other thing going on in the United States about the same time that you all remember from school. They were building this transatlantic railroad system. And to build that system, there was this truly difficult thing you had to be able to do called get over the damn Rocky Mountains. All of you who've ever been on a plane that took you out west, one of the highlights, if you manage to get a window seat, is saying, wow, they're big. And so, Chinese men were brought from Canton to dig what would become the location of the railroad tracks through, among other places, the Rocky Mountains. Now, if you haven't figured it out, this is disgustingly difficult work. I mean, you can get guilt killed if you do the dynamite wrong. And what's worse is the Chinese weren't allowed to bring women in this country. They had to go home, get married, and then try to bring their wife back. It wasn't so easy. Some of their wives became kind of slaves. There were trains that went up and down where they were building that stuff that had prostitutes on them. And would stop so that the guys building the railroad could have sex now and then. Are you getting a sense that our country hasn't always been nice to people? Okay? 
the Chinese started coming to New York City about the same time that Jews from Eastern Europe and Italians from Italy began moving there, about the 1880s. And they did something they had done to survive on the West Coast. They opened restaurants. They didn't open restaurants. Well, they opened restaurants that claimed to serve Chinese food. Any of you ever have xiao mein when you were a kid? Any of you still eat it? It's a West Coast invention for the white people. It is not Chinese food. Any of you ever be in a Chinese restaurant and at the end of the meal you got a fortune cookie? That is Japanese food <laughs> that began to be served in Chinese restaurants when the United States took its Japanese population into internment camps. I've never, I mean, I've been in a fair number of Japanese restaurants, but I, I, I've never had a fortune cookie in a Japanese restaurant, it's just Chinese restaurants. So we're now talking about various different groups bringing extraordinarily different historical experiences to New York on the Lower East Side about the same time. And you know what they did? They hated each other. There's a very famous sociologist whom you never heard of because he would be 110 years old today, so you never had to read him, but I did. His name was Irving Lewis Horowitz. And he grew up on the Lower East Side. And it, I said to him, so what was that like? Because my parents grew up in New Jersey mostly. And he said, going to school was terrible. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the primary school that I went to also had a very big Italian population. And to get to school from our neighborhood, we had to walk through the Italian neighborhood. I was such a dumb kid. I was about 28 at the time. I said, so? And Irving Lewis Horowitz said, well, all the Italian boys would chase us, trying to unbutton our pants to look at our penises. Because they knew that we were circumcised. And they wanted to see it and make fun of us. And I went home. And I told the story to my mother and my father who looked at me with this look. Everyone's parents have this look. I don't know what your parents look, look like. My parents look, look like something like, who told you that? And I wasn't about to say this very famous sociologist named David Irving Louis Horowitz. But it let me know all the kind of things that my father, who lived for a while in Brooklyn, would have gone through when he was growing up. And what it meant to belong to different groups in the United States. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I like restaurants. The thing that's good about restaurants is you don't have to do the dishes. 
This is a major virtue. The Germans who lived in southern Manhattan had German restaurants for the German population. They didn't like it so much when Jews came. Uh, the Italians had Italian restaurants. They didn't like it so much when the Jews came either. But what's even worse, their food wasn't kosher. It says somewhere in the Bible, I'm looking for your husband because I'm sure he knows the chapter, that you should not mix milk and meat. That's trafe. The actual line is that shall not cook a calf in its mother's milk. That sounds pretty just. Doesn't that sound like a just idea? But it wound up, after 2,000 years, being a system that is extraordinarily complex and keeps different kinds of food separated from one another. No meat with milk. Well, that takes care of some of my Italian favorites. So the Jews really didn't go to Italian restaurants. Because if they went to Italian restaurants, they couldn't pretend they were breaking the rules. Doesn't that sound silly? In a sense, if you go back to when the Torah was written, God knows when. It's a series of laws and rules that get reinterpreted continually, like who can eat rice on Passover? Just two years ago. Yeah. Did you know that the Talmud is where the golden rule came from? Yes. I think that's pretty interesting. I just I'm not. It actually, I forgot the name of the rabbi, but it was before Jesus. And it's different from the way the Christians say it. The Christians say, um, someone say the Christian rule. I just forgot it. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And in the Talmud, written about, well, written around zero BC, written around that time, this, rabbi called Hillel wrote, do not treat other people the way you do not want to be treated. The negative was turned into the positive. And Jesus got a lot of credit. Okay? So, Jews started going to Italian restaurants, oh, not sorry, started going to Chinese restaurants. And there are a couple of things to be said for Chinese restaurants. One, they wanted the Jewish customers. Money is money. To hell with this discrimination stuff. Two, you could eat in a Chinese restaurant and pretend that there was no food there that wasn't kosher. For instance, think about egg rolls. They're all cut up into little pieces. It is possible to eat an egg roll without noticing that there is pork and decide the damn thing. And pork is a forbidden food. For Jews as well? Pardon? For Jews as well? Yes. I don't know that. 
Jews are not supposed to eat pork. I still remember, actually, when I was um, in college, um, my family had started going to Chinese restaurants. And I remember going to a Chinese restaurant in Waltham. I went to Brandeis with um, the, the, the women on my floor. And um, of the 10 of us, there was me and um, another woman who came from families that kept kosher. And the other eight all wanted egg rolls. And I remember the experience because I was brought up with a really good sense of guilt. And I remember that as long as that pork was in my mouth, I got a headache, but if I swallowed it really quick, I could have the meal. So, Chinese food, by which I mean Cantonese food, some of which only exists in the United States, became a sophisticated meal that one could afford for Jews living on the Lower East Side. In the 1950s, there were at least 450 Chinese restaurants in New York City, more than any other group, okay? Because eating Chinese food had become a Jewish custom. I remember when my parents took us to a Chinese restaurant, and like many of the people that Harry Levine and I interviewed, a Chinese restaurant was the first restaurant that I ever went to. We were very careful to offer meat dishes, to order meat dishes, and not pork dishes. Because meat, beef, well, their, their preparation of it probably wasn't kosher, but at least it wasn't pork, which was downright forbidden. About, I was telling this story to someone I know who, who grew up in a more religious family than I, and he looked at me and he said, you know, that, those great, those absolutely terrific beef and vegetable meals that you can get in Chinese restaurants? I said, yeah, because that's what we used to eat. We weren't eating pork. He said, they're made with oyster sauce. Oysters are forbidden food. Okay? I guess I should add on that not everyone did this. My family did it as they became more American and less Romanian. But my family also retained or had learned basic American discrimination. So I remember taking my son to a playground on the Upper West Side when he was about four, he's now 39, so it was some time ago. And there are a whole lot of little kids playing. And one kid said to the other kid, look at that Chinese kid over there. Oh, he didn't use the word Chinese. He used a rude term. And the kid said, I'm not Chinese. He was American. Or maybe he was Japanese. 
Or maybe he was Korean. Doesn't matter. All Americans have this extraordinary tendency to call anyone from East Asia Chinese. And I mention that because that was something else that Jews liked about Chinese restaurants. <clears throat> there were all of these American people calling them dirty words. I would tell you some of those dirty words or the dirty words for Chinese, or the dirty words for black, or the dirty words for this, that, or the other thing. But you probably know a lot of them. And universities have changed enough that I am no longer permitted to be accurate when I discuss discrimination in the United States. But Jews could go to Chinese restaurants and know that there was one group that was even more lowly than they were and whom they could treat rudely. I remember, Harry and, you, and I use this in our paper, but I remember that my parents, my sister, my cousin Alan and I were all in a terrific Chinese restaurant in Chinatown. And my father looked at the waiter and ordered fried rice instead of fried rice. My sister was about six then, and she didn't know what was going on. Alan and I were 10. And we were so embarrassed. We were old enough to know. We were not old enough to know that the English word that my family had learned for Chinese and for going to a Chinese restaurant was a swear word. So I also remember being in about seventh grade, going to the Jewish Y, and then a whole bunch of us, some from other towns, were going out to a restaurant to celebrate, you know, we'd been dancing and stuff, all that sophisticated stuff seventh graders do. And I said, fantastic, are we going to, bad word. And this guy from another town and looked at me and said, you know, that's a bad word. And I didn't know that. When I went to see my cousin in San Francisco around Christmas, he reminded me of the occasion because he remembered it too. Okay? Now today, there aren't as many Jewish immigrants, so a fair number have come in from Russia and the Ukraine since the 70s. It's not like the 1880s. Or when my family came in around 1905. We're more likely to be middle class now. My father's family was downright poor. And they sent my father's sister to live with her uncle and aunt because they couldn't afford feeding all the children in the house. I am not downright poor. 
Neither is my sister. We've become increasingly American. Sometimes it's embarrassing to say that. But the other thing that happened is there were these little, I finally got to the topic, getting to the topic of the talk, these finally little things that we grew up doing once our parents let us go to Chinese restaurants. I assume none of you are from New York. Is that a safe assumption? Has anybody ever tried waiting on line to see a good movie with fantastic reviews in New York? Sometimes you can feel like an idiot. So the Jews made a terrific discoverer. The only restaurants open on Christmas were Chinese restaurants. And they loved having Jews come in and spend money. And then, because all of those Americans were home celebrating Christmas, you could get into a movie without a line. This is a big thing. I once was laughing about this with a roommate who was Italian. And she said, I never go to the movies on Christmas. I said, why? There are no lines. She said, I'm Christian. I go to things with my family. She said, I go to the movies on Yom Kippur, it's a Jewish fast day. Guaranteed, no line. Okay? So what I've just told you is that when we talk about America or the United States, it's not only not this ideal place, but that separately and together, we make up customs about food, about what to wear. About what's a good drink. They change over time. And they vary depending upon where our ancestors came from. We know if we simply read the news, that the United States is having more and more Latinos try to immigrate here. And we know that there are people as happy to see the Latinos as the know-nothing group in the 1840s was to see the Irish. Do you know in the 1920s there were still signs on factories in New England that said Irish need not apply? Did you know that when the first college basketball programs were established. There were, they, they, they were all, you know, there were a bunch of southern schools and there were a bunch of western schools and the schools that made the different leagues all had something in common. And then there was a separate league found in New England. It was called the Catholic League. Okay? So we know 
that there are all these people coming into the United States now who are going to change the character of the United States. Much as my father quit school when he was 14 because the family needed the money he could earn. And I am a professor who has traveled for free all over the world by people who invited me. Gosh knows what the Latinos are going to bring. Who knows what their combinations are going to be. In Chile, I had a Fulbright to Chile, and one of the things I learned was that really exotic food came from Peru. Okay? So what we're talking about when we say Jews and Christmas is the way that the United States will be changed for your children and certainly your grandchildren. Thank you for sitting through all this.